Before we start talking about our fourth method and probably most useful method for solving quadratics, I wanted to take a moment in this video to recap what we've learned so far in terms of the methods uh, we've already learned. So the first method we learned in the very beginning of the course and we reviewed already in this unit is isolating the variable. So if we look at a couple examples of where that ends up working out the best, there are going to be two examples that like this. x squared equals 25 and then x plus 2 quantity squared minus 4 equals 12. Isolating a variable only works when you have a single x term, or in this case an x term uh, combined in one term, and when you solve each of these, you can use square roots. So in this problem, for example, I can take the square root of both sides, and that allows me to say that x is equal to 5, but also negative 5. And so that's all our solution would be. In the second example here, I before take the square root, have to get rid of the minus 4. So I would add that 4 to both sides, leaving me with x plus 2, all of that squared, equals, and then 12 plus 4, which is going to give me 16. Once again, this is going to allow me to be able to take the square root of both sides, just as we were able to in the last example, since the x is contained inside of that squared term. That gives me x plus 2 equals, and then this will be plus or minus 4, since the square root of 16 is 4. At this point, we would solve the problem by subtracting 2. Keep in mind that plus minus 4 means two answers, positive 4 and negative 4. So when I write each of these answers, I have to consider first positive 4 minus 2, which is 2, and then negative 4 minus 2, which is negative 6. And these would be my two answers here. The problem is that solving with square roots is not going to work when you have an x squared term and an x term in the problem, as we see here with number 3 and with number 4. So while this method is very useful, the problem is it's a simple, easy procedure, but it's only going to work when you have an x squared term. So take a moment to pause this video and write down this uh, summary of isolating the variable. Once we learned isolating the variable doesn't work all the time, we learned another very useful method that we spent most of this course working with, and that is factoring. So the two examples that we just took a look at here, example 3 and example 4, you can use factoring to actually solve these instead. So in the number 3 example, I have a GCF, or greatest common factor of x in both these terms. I can pull that x out, and that's going to leave me with x plus 12 as my remainder. Now, the idea of factoring is that once you have factored each of the x's, that you can set each individual factor set equal to its own equation. So x would equal 0, and x plus 12 would equal to 0. Well, this one's already solved, and here I'd subtract the 12, leaving me with x equals negative 12. Useful method because it's quick, easy, and we have our solutions. If we look at example 4, however, I'm going to have to use a little bit of a different method. Now, one of the easiest methods we learned in this course was something called the snowflake method or the asterisk method. And when you use that method, it's just essentially organizing what numbers and factors that we need to work with here. So in order to factor this, I need to find a pair of numbers that multiply to get negative 12, but also add to get a 1. And so 3 and 4 look to be that factor, and 3 would have to be the negative 1. So these would be my two factors, and thus I can factor this equation as x minus 3 times x plus 4 equals 0. Once again, I can set each of these factors equal to 0, so x minus 3 equals 0, x plus 4 equals 0, and we solve each of these. So x is equal to 3, and x is equal to negative 4, and those are my two answers here. Factoring was a very useful method for us in the first half of this course, and we were able to use it to solve a lot of different problems. However, in the beginning of this unit, we talked a little bit about the idea that factoring also is not going to be the best method for solving quadratics. The main reason leads us to something like example 5 here. x squared plus 4x equals 17. Now, even if you decided to say, hey, you know what? I can move that 17 over and make it x squared plus 4x minus 17 equals 0. And so I'll write that over here on the side. Because sometimes you're going to think, hey, I can do this. I can set up my snowflake or asterisk here and solve it this way. The problem that you're going to run into is when you want to fill the bottom rung in here, I need a pair of numbers that multiply to get negative 17, but add to get 4. None, no such pair exists. 
And so this is considered to be not factorable. And most quadratics aren't going to be factorable. And so while the factoring, the snowflake, the asterisk method, whatever you call it, is a great method, it's a quick way to solve a trinomial and easy to solve small equations, the problem is only some trinomials are going to be factorable. And so this led us into the problem that we started this whole unit with. How are we going to solve for all quadratics? And so we learned a new method just recently called completing the square. And completing the square is something that is going to be able to solve any type of quadratic. Every single quadratic you can use completing the square for. And so if I go back to my examples here, and we look at number 5, we know we can't factor it, but I can use completing the square. And so we learn with completing the square that if you, if you move your constant term, the one without an x, over to the right-hand side like we already have, that you can add a strategic term to both sides to allow this left side to become factorable. And so the number that we're going to be able to put in here, and we also have to do it to the other side, is going to be the number that is one half of the middle term, and then you square it. So half of four is two, and then two squared is four. And so the number that I need to put in here is going to be a four. And I must do that to the other side because otherwise I would not, I would have an unbalanced equation. This then allows me to factor this to become x plus 2 quantity squared. And if you forget that shortcut, you can always use the snowflake or asterisk method. And this ends up being 21. Well, now I have something I can solve. Because I can solve it using, going back to our methods here, that looks like a classic isolating the variable type of question. And so going back to this problem, I can take the square root of both sides and get x plus 2 equals plus or minus the square root of 21. I can't break down the square root of 21. Subtracting 2 from both sides, I'm just going to leave my answer here as negative 2, plus or minus the square root of 21. Those are my two possible answers, plus 21 and then minus root 21. And thus I have my answer. Completing the square works for every single type of quadratic. However, if we look at number 6, if I take half of 5, well, half of 5 is 2.5. And when I square 2.5, I'm going to end up with a decimal. And so while completing the square will indeed work for number 6, I'm going to end up exploring a much more difficult problem because I'm going to have to use decimals. And so when we take a look at our summary here for completing the square, yes, a pro here is you can solve for any quadratic equation using this method. But at times, this can be a long and complicated procedure. And the number one reason why we want to look for a new method is it's especially difficult using fractional terms. And so what we need to look at here at this point is, can we use something else that's a little less complicated and will work well, especially when you have an odd number as your middle term of the trinomial? So isolating the variable is very easy. Factoring is an easy process, and completing the square works for all. But they all have their cons, and so this leads us to a question of what can we do now?